Okay, get out your word of the day. All right, Riley, the limit is 3,000 words. How many pages does that end up being? About 500. So how many pages? <laughs> Five hundred 
So about six pages is the limit for my class. If you go up to 10, that's fine. And then if when you're submitting it, we'll find ways to pass. No, I'm just saying. So if you do, if you want to go over for the contest, it has to be under 3,000 words. So we're doing this one. All right, you have word of the day out. Our word today, I'm gonna to put you over here. <laughs> Our word is actually a phrase, it's in media res. Excuse me, what? That sounds like scientific. In media res. Oh, the media is probably it's always Latin. Okay, you ready for the definition? Yes. All right. So the practice of beginning a narrative by starting in the middle of a crucial situation. Oh, I hate those. And there I was. Yeah. How I got hey, just starting a narrative in the middle of a crucial situation. Like yes. So you guys were all talking about that meme where it's like record skip. Ah, you're probably wondering how I got into the middle of this situation. Yeah, that would be an example of in res. Yes, that would be an example of an media res. Yeah, for sure. Yeah. The example I immediately think of is the first book of the series I'm reading, The Alphabet Book, called Anne. He's like, and there I was, strapped to my shelf with that. Okay, wait, Miss Bora. All right, so write down. So write down the example, which is just the first line of the crane line. Uh, the crane line. Ten days after I called off my engagement, I was supposed to go on a scientific expedition. So everyone's copying that down, right? Yeah, 10 days after I called off my engagement, I was supposed to go on a scientific expedition. I don't like like this. I don't like three years. Yeah, I almost married. Oh, that's a reference to Jane Eyre. So it's uh, in Jane Eyre, she says, reader, I married him. And so she's referencing this piece of classical literature that ends in a marriage. You didn't like that? <laughs> no, she just says to the read, she says, reader, I married him. To talk oh, about like, I married him. I think it's reader, I married him. Oh, no, 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 no. She just directly addresses the reader. <laughs> OK, you got it written down? Okay, so let's talk about the effects of starting in media rest. So you could think of all of those examples. You can think of this example here. What is it? Why do you think a writer would choose to start um, their story in the middle of a main event? Isabella? Okay, why would that help to get them hooked? It's like a cliffhanger. <laughs> okay, now Isabella. Oh, um. <laughs> Okay, good. Good. Get them 
more interesting than the middle of the action. Yeah, a lot of times the middle of the action is the most interesting part of the action. So you start with the most interesting part to get them home. Megan? I was going to say, I feel like rereading it, like if you just took out like the two explicit sentences, then maybe you just thought, like, oh, it wasn't there, and you just skipped the I went to Texas to study with Jesus. I'm not just what saying. <laughs> oh, <laughs> if yeah. you just read that, it doesn't seem like this to me. It almost feels like someone's just explaining their like, uh, trip. Because, like, it, although it's like a graded essay, it feels like the fact that they start off, she starts off that way, makes you think, like, oh, so it wasn't just about, like, her going on a scientific trip to go study birds. No, yeah. that has more meaning. Okay, good. So you start also not just the most interesting, but maybe the most meaningful bit of information as well to show that it has this personal importance to the reader. Yeah, yeah, it yeah. does. Zoe and then Tori. So I think it only takes them like two minutes to wrap up their trip, which reminds me of the Okay, good. So hint at. <laughs> The braid, I think that uh, this is, I don't know if it was obvious, but this is an example of a braided essay where you've got the story of the whooping crane expedition and then you have the story of the breakup and those ideas are braided together. Um, in this one, there isn't really the informational section, but we do get this information about whooping cranes and what it would be like to go on one of these expeditions. I say whooping, but whooping cranes. Nope, it's whooping. Um, so it kind of like shows that there's going to be a connection between the two parts of the story too. We start, she actually starts with the connection. Riley? Yes. Absolutely. You think of that story where they're like, go, Rrr! you might be wondering, it's this kind of like way of shocking someone. It's a bit of a clickbaity start, honestly, to say like, here's the most interesting thing, you're going to click on it and you're going to want to read the rest of the story to find out how I got here and what happens from here. So we start out with the most juicy part of the story. I called off my engagement. That's fun. Spill the tea, right? Like I want to know exactly why you called off your engagement. Everybody wants to know how people break up, right? Like that's a fun story. So <laughs> it's sad, but it's like, those are the juicy details that we want when we're getting drama from other people's relationships, right? I don't necessarily, it's not that I don't care about the story of the whooping cranes, but like, I'm going to be way more interested in the human drama here. So I want to hear about that. I like that shock value. Is there any other reason why she would want to start this story at the beginning with the breakup of the engage the breakup? Sorry, in the middle. Okay, good. I think there's a part here that it also hints or foreshadows the themes. This is not going to be a super lovey-dovey story about how people met and uh, lived happily ever after. We are starting with the idea that there is not going to be a happily ever after. All right, get some effects written down if you haven't already and then put away word of the day. But we're gonna keep reading the crane line, so keep that open. Yeah. Um, in this book that I was telling you, this book, like, there I was, strapped to, uh, Altar made of the disciples who would have to sacrifice And then he goes on to something completely different. You're like, okay, what? I mean, she does that too a little bit. Like she like moves past the engagement. I was breaking up an engagement. Let me tell you about whooping things. And then he was supposed to be And then he keeps like mentioning it and he's like, you wonder where this is gonna happen? Book five. <laughs> That's a good way to really get people to buy your book. All right, we're going to look at the, first, the beginning part of this. Um, while we are doing that, we're going to start writing your braided essays today. So pull out your Chromebooks and get those running because I know they take a while to get started. Mm. Yeah, so yeah, or you can handwrite. What is Friday? I am not handwriting. Yeah, right. Yes, or you can handwrite. It's fine. I just 
okay. All right, so as you are getting that out and as you're getting that started, let's not waste time. Let's actually talk about the beginning of this essay. So let's read the whole thing. It says, 10 days after I called off my engagement, I was supposed to go on a scientific expedition to study the whooping crane on the Gulf Coast of Texas. Surely I will cancel this trip, I thought, as I shopped for nylon hiking pants that zipped off at the knee. Surely a person who calls off a wedding is meant to be sitting sadly at home, reflecting on the enormity of what has transpired and not doing whatever it is I'm about to be doing that requires a pair of plastic clogs with drainage holes. Surely, I thought, as I tried on a very large and floppy hat featuring a pole cord that fa fastened beneath my chin, it would be wrong to even be wearing a hat that looks like this when something in my life has gone so terribly wrong. Ten days earlier, I had cried and I had yelled and I had packed up my dog and driven away from the upstate New York house with two willow trees I had bought with my fiance. Ten days later, and I didn't want to do anything I was supposed to do. So this is how she's starting off this personal story. Um, of the expedition, right? This is how she's starting. And I want us to, guys, stop. I want us to recognize what she is doing with her language choices here. So she's a creative writer. She's making creative decisions to hook us in. One of those things is starting in media res. What else does she do in this very first little portion that you think um, contributes to us kind of being interested in her story? Yeah, I guess she mentions, like, at the end of the essay, where she's like, I packed up my dog, she packed up everything, and then she says, and I took the wind and those things and went to my kids and then she doesn't mention it again after that. Okay, good. So she like sets up the characters right at the very beginning and creates this kind of mystery around the characters. And so that we are like still left wondering why she did this. She doesn't tell us right up front. Here's why I broke off the engagement. Now let me tell you the story. She kind of she sets the scene for us before she tells us the beats. Yeah. She talks about Okay, good. So she sets like a very clear and uh, unexpected or unusual tone to the beginning. We're expecting if it's about a breakup to be about how devastated she was, but she's kind of shocking us with the tone she uses, which is full of jokes. Like she's making jokes in the beginning. Yeah. Uh, mystery. About. Does it feel like those are Yes. Then they introduce us to all the characters, and then you start to find out right. what it means among us is in media res. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, so it creates mystery in the events, too. Um, and with the images. So it's like, uh, I think, yeah, it introduces us to the body before the actual characters that could be suspected in this case it's introducing us to the action this expedition and the breakup without telling us the whys of it all right what else is she doing like with her creative writing here at the beginning like what do you notice about the way that she is wording all of these things that she's talking about you know what like a thought process to me. yes there's interior dialogue and the thought process it's the same thing yeah change what you said um no. yeah so she actually is saying like what she was thinking in her head surely i will cancel this trip i thought as i shot for nylon hiking pants and zipped off at the knee why do you think it would be a good idea to include some kind of dialogue in your story you don't have to but why might well, it be useful he just said i shot for some pants it's not as exciting somehow why would dialogue make it better yeah Like it, it automatically gives you the fact to be to be inside the head. That's why I feel like stories can like get expected to a certain person and it's just really like popular. Yeah. Because you can gain a lot of insight into the characters <coughs> through voice and even the head and the thought process and the the book. Yes, 
absolutely. Almost all of the young adult literature that I have read has been written in the first person, partly for this reason. Um, she's writing the whole thing in the first person, but she's taking us even a step further by saying, and these were the things I was thinking. And so we get attached to her right away. Um, there is an alternative version of this story that her fiance has written, you know? Oh. Not actually. <laughs> Sorry. Oh, I said that wrong. That. But like, we could imagine that, right? The fiance is out there telling oh. his friends like, oh, my fiance wrote a story that got really popular, but here's my version of events. Like she never let me know that she needed things from me, right? Or she blah, 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 blah. But we're getting, we're kind of attached to this character right from the beginning. So we are completely on her side and not on his side. Em? Um, what was that? Okay, so it's like we get a sense of their motivations and when motivations and like thought processes are an important part of your story, like especially for her, she's basically like using this story to explain how she gaslit herself, you know, um, when that becomes a really important part of your story, it makes sense to represent the thought patterns to your reader as well. Okay, yeah. Sorry. Yes, that would work, I think. Yeah. Oh, good. Okay, um, let's look at um, maybe a couple more things that she's doing at the beginning here. Is there any other choices she's making in her creative writing um, that help kind of like hook us into the story? Yeah? I mean, it definitely set the theme of like, um, it was like especially like repeated a lot in high school. Like such a huge major that put the whole essay to that is like, um, I'm doing what I'm told is wrong. I'm not doing what I'm supposed to. And that's like a common theme throughout the whole essay, but it's super like Absolutely. It sets the theme right from the beginning. And I'm even going to go so far as to say that's kind of like foreshadowing the theme. Um, even though we're not quite clear how that's going to fit into <laughs> into her story of the engagement, there's still this kind of foreshadowing right from the beginning, and she talks about it multiple times. It's really smart. Yeah. Um, there's a lot of details. Yes. Like all precise details, like lobby hat, billboard, paper box, stuff like that. Yeah, and I think like you know how Dane was like, um, it wouldn't have been as interesting if she was just like, and I bought some pants. I think part of that, the interior dialogue adds to the interest. And part of that is all this visual detail of how dumb these clothes are. She's going to wear a large floppy hat that has a pull cord fastened beneath the chin. Like she's kind of setting the tone through all the details and how kind of like she's willing to be like playful and silly this moment right after she broke off an engagement. So these details really do help set the tone and then the theme and so on. Megan, what were you saying? I was just like really interested. Okay. Like, um, the way her like burning head and like it's not and like I know it's an essay but like the fact that she has not had that is not specifically about the topic of the now. Mm. She has like she she takes it different. And like I know people really think it's like oh engagement I'm gonna tell us no but it seems like she yeah. Because she breaks those conventions right yeah. away. She's like, this is not going to be generic. It's going to be unusual. Matthew, um, did you have? Yeah. yeah. No, that's we are, we never have anything due on Friday in here. So next Tuesday. Okay, so I think I think we kind of covered all of the stuff. Oh, one more thing I want us to look at. Do you see like her varying lengths of paragraphs? Yeah. <laughs> Don't be afraid to do that in your essay. 
that's perfectly fine. You get to be creative in this. So if you want to play with the format a little bit, that's all right. You can have as, as paragraphs that are one line. You can have paragraphs that are two pages if it's done intentionally. Bella? I was, yeah, basically saying like one line is or something that really Yes, absolutely. So it's like what we get from this is we know that like what she was actually wearing is not the really important part of this essay. What's really important is this idea that she doesn't want to do anything she was supposed to do. That's way more important. All right. So um, I am going to have you now try writing the first paragraph of your braided essay. If you have already written it, you're gonna try and write a different first paragraph. So we're doing some writing exercises today, just to give you like some kind of ideas of options for how to start these things. Um, so I know a lot of you have already started and some of you are even close to being done. That is so amazing, but we can, we can still do these creative writing exercises separately and you can decide if you wanna incorporate any of this stuff. So open a new Google Doc. And you are going to try writing a paragraph that includes at least two of these techniques. So let me number the techniques. Foreshadowing, clear characters through mystery, some unusual, unexpected tone, humor. I'm going to do interior dialogue as the fifth. Tons of detail, almost where it seems um, excessive there. And then I'm going to do varying paragraph lengths in the seventh. Okay. So you're gonna choose two of those numbered techniques to incorporate at the beginning of your story. This is not the paragraph you're going to have to end up using. Um, you can, you know, you can trash it after after today if you hate it, but you're just gonna try and get started on writing this thing. Oh, sorry, number eight is in media res. You can just try starting your story in the middle of things. Well, you could. <laughs> You oh, yeah. totally, I was born and the light. Um, you totally can. You're just choosing two of these things. So do not try to incorporate all eight of them. Just choose two techniques that can inspire you. And I'm gonna give you 10 minutes then to try starting this story in this way. Yeah. Just for Should we practice, write two too. not for like how it has to be when you turn it in. You're just gonna try and start it. So however much you can write in 10 minutes. Uh so two paragraphs. Okay. Yeah. But like we have we're using two of these, so we do two paragraphs. No, not necessarily. Like if you if you have one paragraph that includes a lot of interior dialogue and tons of detail, then it would just be one paragraph. You're just incorporating two of these techniques into the beginning of your essay. Does that make any more sense? Kind of. Okay, so if you still do not know what you are writing about, pull me over and we will get you inside together.
Right. It's an awesome spot. Yeah, that's totally into your res and it's fun and it also creates that mystery and dark. Probably dramatic too, although I don't know. But food is pretty much the key. Kind of just goes up there. Yeah, Start starting with that there. intense.
That's a little bit scary. Oh my god, I don't I like this. Oh my god, I don't I like this. I How are you guys doing? Do you have your beginning? And he's rich. I don't know. Okay, I don't know. But Jack of Diamonds. Okay, I'm going to give you three more minutes to keep trying to write it like this. Like, try to write it with two of these. And 
then we're going to look at a different intro. So that you can kind of see all the so how did the money get in your eye? I don't know what it was that you guys Oh. Yeah. I don't know. I Something is not right. Yeah. Could you feel it? No. <laughs> but it like no. you don't hurt, but did, did you like feel it like I sorry, just to like clarifying. Nowhere. I want you to try and do this. Um even if you've already written part of your essay, because I want you to give yourself options of how to how to start it. And if by the end of the session, eat the new beginning, you can erase it from the beginning. You okay, Evan? Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Sweetie, how you doing? How are you doing? It's the dog. It's the kiss. Sorry, I don't need to be so close to you. Can you see me? Do you want to know how much? An honor student, ladies and gentlemen. <laughs> Is that going to be part of your story? I have heard that. It's like a, the flea market scam, but for free. Yeah, for free. I always got a TV from that. What? What did you trade for a TV? A straw. <laughs> oh. You don't have to. 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 Yeah. Yes, yes, I remember that. Oh, I passed these back. Oh, oh. Uh, I gave Bella one over there. Oh, so I, I, I thought she was just like, I got to go back. Brothers. <laughs> okay, pause in your work. We are going to look at another example now. So I just gave you this essay called Brothers. Did everyone get it passed back to them? Are they from other mothers? Okay, this is not a uh, braided essay. This is just a personal essay, but I wanted to show you how he started his personal <laughs> essay because I think it's a, it's a different way and it's an equally legitimate way. So, this much is fact. There is a home movie of the two of us sitting on the edge of the swimming pool at our grandma and grandpa's old apartment building in Culver City. The movie, taken sometime in early 1960, is in color, though the color is faded, leaving my brother Brad and me milk white and harmless children. Me, a, half, a year and a half old, Brad almost four, our brown hair faded to only the thought of brown hair. Our mother, impossibly young, sits next to me on the right of the screen. Her hair, for all the fading of the film, is coal black, shoulder length, and parted in the middle, curled up on the sides. She has on a bathing suit covered in purple and blue flowers. The color in them is nearly gone. 
Next to me on the left of the screen is Brad in his white swimming trunks. I am in the center, my fat arms bent, my fat arms up, bent at the elbows, fingers curled into fists, my legs kicking away at the water, splashing and splashing. I am smiling, the baby of the family, the center of the world at that very instant. Though my little brother, Tim, is only some six or seven months off. And my little sister, Leslie, the last child, just three years distant. The pool water before us is only a thin sky blue. The bushes behind us a dull and lightless light green. There is no sound. My mother speaks to me, points at the water, then looks up. She lifts a hand to block the sun, says something to the camera. Her skin is the same white as ours, but her lips are red, a sharp cut of lipstick moving as she speaks. I am still kicking. Brad is looking to his right, off the screen, his feet in the water too, but moving slowly. His hands are on the edge of the pool, and he leans forward a little, looks down into the water. My mother still speaks to the camera, and I give an extra hard kick, splash up shards of white water. Brad flinches at the water, squints his eyes while my mother laughs, puts a hand to her face. She looks back at the camera, keeps talking, a hand low to the water to keep more from hitting her. I still kick hard, still send up bits of water, and I am laughing a baby's laugh. Open mouth and eyes nearly closed, arms still up, fingers still curled into fists. More water splashes at Brad, who leans over to me, says something. <laughs> Nothing about me changes. I only kick, laugh. He says something again. His face leans a little closer to mine. Still, I kick. This is when he lifts his left hand from the edge of the pool, places it on my right thigh, and pinches hard. It's not a simple pinch, not two fingers on a fraction of skin, but his whole hand, all his fingers grabbing the flesh just above my knee and squeezing down hard. He grimaces, his eyes on, my hand, on his hand on my leg. My expression changes, of course. In an instant, I go from a laughing baby to a shocked one, my mouth a perfect O, my body shivering so that my legs kick even harder, even quicker, but just this one last time. They stop and I cry, my mouth open even more, my eyes all the way closed, my hands are still in fists. Then Brad's hand is away and my mother turns from speaking to the camera to me. She leans in close, asking, I am certain, what's wrong? The movie cuts then to my grandma, white skin and silver hair, seated on a patio chair by the pool. Above her, a green and white striped umbrella. She has a cigarette in one hand, waves off the camera with the other. Though she died eight years ago, and though she too loses color with each viewing, she is still alive up there, still waves, annoyed, at my grandpa and his camera, the moment my brother pinched hell out of me, already gone. All right, so the way he starts this story is a lot different than the way the crane wife starts. Let's talk about some of the techniques that he's what, what, what was that? What I just wrote, I feel like it's more similar to this. Oh, really? What made it, what made it more similar to me? Uh, just like the, I feel like there's the personal detail of like a story. Yeah, good. Okay, so I would even call this what feels like at the beginning excessive detail. Um, that it's like, it's not just like my brother pinched me. It's like my brother put his right hand on my left leg and he pinched me in this particular way so that it almost feels like, did you guys ever have to do that assignment where your teacher made you describe how to make a peanut butter and jelly sandwich? Yeah. yeah. And it's like, you have that. to, you know, screw open the lid and like, they almost go through this like very excessive detail, assuming like trying to say that they're making no assumptions for the reader. It feels like he's doing that in this story, where it's like, I'm not going to make any assumptions. I'm going to describe it exactly how it was, even if you maybe don't need all of that detail. What else does he do in the beginning too that uh, feels different than how there's? Yeah, Zoe? Yeah. 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 Oh, yeah. Okay, cool. So it's like um, from. A present perspective, looking at the past as though it was present. So what Zoe's talking about is this idea that it's, it keeps saying like this isn't really happening now and it keeps insisting on that, like reminding you of that by saying the colors have faded. This was back in time. Grandma has died now, right? Like this isn't present. And yet, the way that it's describing it is, I am in the center, my fat arms up, bent at the elbows, like this is happening right now. So it takes on this present tense 
to the story that makes it seem like it's happening in that moment, but then make sure to remind you it's actually the past. Yeah. And it has to be a lot of people foreshadowing too um, because foreshadowing because what do you assume if someone starts with the phrase this much is fact what do you assume is going to come up in the rest of the story yeah. part of it is going to be fact right this much is fact but what is the assumption that about the rest of it yeah, part of it might be opinion, over-dramatized, biased. All I know is that this image exists. Now I'm going to take that image, that objective reality, I'm going to take the objective and I'm going to pontificate about it. I'm going to think about it. I'm going to create meaning from the objective. But I'm going to start with something that is objective. All right, here's your next assignment. You ready? So you've written the first part that you were copying Hauser. That's awesome. You were copying kind of like um, at least a couple of her techniques. You are now going to press enter a couple times and you are going to start your essay over again. So you are giving yourself another option for how to begin your essay. I think too often when um, students are writing, they're like, okay, I've done it once. That's the perfect way to do it. <laughs> I've done it once and that's the best I can do, right? But with creative writing, you want to give yourself a lot of different options for how to do things because it's creative and you can, you know, make a lot of choices. So for this one, you need to choose, choose this one, copying a movie uh, and or you need to choose at least one of these techniques to copy. So either you're going to be writing in the present tense rather the past. You're going to include excessive amounts of detail. You're going to kind of copy what it would look like to be in, for it to be a film. Like you're going to make edits and jumps. Or you're going to have a very objective image at the beginning without any sort of like emotional input. Just this happened, this happened, this happened. So you're going to choose at least one of these things to copy and write yourself an alternative beginning. So who has questions about what you're doing? So when we are done with today, you know, when, in 15 minutes, you're going to have two openings for your essay that you can choose from. All right, cool. Then I'm going to give you 10 minutes to do four things. One way to go about this if you're feeling lost is to choose one very important image from your story. And do you remember that little um, that little essay we read about like taking a one inch photograph and just describing what is in that one inch one inch picture? Um, you could choose one important image from your story, wherever that occurs in your story, and just describe it and come back with your thoughts. That would be one way to start. I'm gonna start my pair story. Yeah, you're good.
Focus, this is good work time. <laughs> okay, multitask. All right. <laughs> yeah, because then the rest is warm and I do it too. How do you know that? I know It's MLA, so the font will be 12 points, and it, yeah, it'll be double spaced. <laughs>
<laughs> okay, I'm going to show you mine in a in a I'm going to be vulnerable here and show you my creative writing about my personal story. Um so I've decided, I've kind of combined them too. I, I started in media res a little, but I'm trying to copy the style from brothers with like uh, an excessive amount of detail. So I say, we are crammed inside a white geo prism. Oops, we got to capitalize the name of cars. Plaid clad thighs pressed against ripped doodle covered jeans. AFI is the art of drowning. That would be a album so i gotta do mla pound sue stereo drowning out the noise of five teenagers trying to scream in falsetto we are driving along an almost completely deserted state street in orem utah 15 miles over the speed limit windows down on an october night julia has the heater turned up against the cold the juxtaposition of senses that only she seemed to enjoy oops seems i want present tense but she pays for the car insurance so she gets the final say the wind would be blowing our hair if it wasn't slicked back into elaborate hairstyles. Mohawks gelled together with whipped egg whites. He always smelled so bad. Red Liberty spikes standing straight up from the crown of Mike's head and my greasy ponytail fading from the manic panic blue dye I used three months ago to a kind of brownish green smir smurf poop color. That's how I want to start my, that's how I want to start my essay. So it's a, it's a scene, a snapshot of the 90s. There it is. All right, 1999 was that that time. <laughs> um, well, I would, but I want to move us on because we've done a lot of talking about the personal narrative part, but we haven't done a lot of talking about how to do the research part. So I'm going to give you an example now. Of and if you, if you that uh, copy of Brothers is yours to keep. Yours to keep. If you want to finish reading it, you totally have I kind of don't want pinching brother. All right, I'm going to give you an example of a very kind of standard graded essay. A lot of people will use this example to show students what a graded essay actually is. So if you're still feeling like, I'm not so sure, this is going to be a good one for you. Does Aaron look like the little kid wizard? <laughs> Okay, so this essay is the story of um, someone who is visiting Vietnam. Um, no, sorry, visiting the Aerospace Maintenance Regeneration Center. But Those he's talking, yes, he's talking about <laughs> Vietnam. He's talking about his father's experience in Vietnam and specifically with Agent Orange, which was like their chemical warfare. And the story that he's bringing together is what it was like for this kid to grow up with a physical disability that came from his father being exposed to Agent Orange. So the author here, Ben Quick, he was born with um, a disfigurement. His hand was kind of just... Um, like fused together. And so he's gone through a whole bunch of surgeries to get, you know, fingers um, that he can use and so on. And he kind of had to come to terms with what that meant to have that disability. 
And the reason he was born with that disability was because his father was exposed to Agent Orange in Vietnam. So there's three braids to this one. Is there's him or three strands of the braid. Um, <coughs> there is him visiting this aerospace regeneration center. There is the thread of what the kind of history of Agent Orange and its use in Vietnam was. And then there is the thread of what it was like growing up. Um, so he's got these three threads that he's braiding together. The first thread is him visiting that site. I want you to skip to where it has a little, I drew a little number two on the second page. And this is the research portion of this. So you might be thinking of this as a kind of informational essay. And this is how he's writing the informational part. I'm just going to read this section to you. Sorry, the, I know the copy is not the great, the greatest for the text. Okay. It says, January 20th, 1961, eight inches of snow fall on Washington, D.C., initiating one of the worst traffic jams ever in the nation's capital as John F. Kennedy takes his inaugural vows. Up to this point, American involvement in the turmoil of Southeast Asia has been secondary, mainly involving the grudging flow of money and arms to the fragile DM regime. Sorry, I never have known to say that in South Vietnam. But conservatives in the capital are calling for more than a half-hearted attempt to fill the vacuum left by France's withdrawal from the region. And the new American president is young and Irish Catholic, a suspect combination in mid-century American politics. He's worried that Republicans will paint him pink if he doesn't hold the South from communist uh, guerrillas. He sets out to do so, and to do it with gusto, expanding U.S. military operations in a manner later described by Noam Chomsky as a move from terror to aggression. The word counterinsurgency begins to appear more and more frequently in the speeches of American politicians, a long and awkward utterance. It is a word that depends on the existence of the root word insurgency, defined by Webster's as a condition of revolt against a government that is less than an organized revolution and that is not recognized as belligerency. In the case of Vietnam, the people charged with perpetrating the state of revolt, the insurgents, are a loose but growing number of communist soldiers, recently given the tacit approval of the Hanoi government in North Vietnam, they have been conducting night raids on military posts and villages in the South under the name Liberate, National Liberation Front and have become known condescendingly to DM supporters as the Viet Cong. In Vietnam, countering these insurgents means, de meant denying, sorry, means denying the Viet Cong and their allies in the countryside and hills the apparatus of survival, food and forest. Before long, the primary method of denial becomes the aerial application of a, a variety of defoliants. In 1961, accepting a joint recommendation from the state and defense departments, President Kennedy signs a resolution accelerating the program. Spraying will intensify in three distinct plant communities. The dense broadleaf vegetation that blankets the Vietnam outback and turns roads and supply routes into ambush zones. The mangroves that line swamps and provide habitat for the catfish and shrimp that are staples of the Vietnamese diet. And the fields of foodstuffs, rice, manioc, and sweet potatoes, and he goes on to describe what Agent Orange is actually doing. So, what do you notice about the way that he is, like, about the creative kind of way that he has chosen to present the informational part of he can say? <laughs> What do you notice about the choices that he's making with the writer, Riley? Yes. Okay, good. There is more of a casual, casual tone to this. Um, and I think part of that is what Riley's talking about, this idea that it's not in this like very conventional structure. Here's what I'm going to talk about. Here are my three main points. Now that is what I've talked about. It's not set up in that way. It's more like, hey, let me tell you about this information that I have that you might find interesting in order to understand my story. Um, wh what else do you notice about the way that he's wording this part? Yeah, Megan. Belligerent? Is that in there? It's, a, it's really the recommended as the point of growing head, and that is not the point of growing head. I don't know where it is. 
It's on paragraph B, which is the anticipation. Yes, belligerency. Okay. Okay, good. Do you see the word in paragraph B, but to me it looks like what does belligerent mean? Let me finish speaking. Stubbornness. What do you mean by that? Like, like the fact that there's written words and like, uh, it was written Yeah. Okay, so he's got more of an academic tone in this section, even though he's being casual with that, more casual than maybe we're used to seeing in a research paper, there's still this kind of um, academic um, credibility to it, where we look to him and we think, this guy is an expert. I trust him about what he's saying here. Why? One way that you're going to create that credibility is through your sourcing. So you are actually borrowing from other places that information so that we know that this is actually like this is real information that it comes from a credible source. Anything else that he's doing in that section that you think is interesting for the research part? Yeah, Megan. Yeah, so he is still telling this, and Riley started with this idea too, telling this like a story. It still has a kind of plot. Do you notice how he sets up the setting? He's like, it's January 20th, 1961. There's eight inches of snow on DC. It's one of the worst traffic jams. We don't have to know that information to understand what Agent Orange is, right? So why is he including that information? Why include what the weather was like on JFK's inaugural day? Cameron? What were you going to say, though? Okay, good. So, it, so it really was calm before the storm. Yeah. You know what Dane said too, though? I, he, you said it flippantly, like, oh, this, does, this is a joke answer, but I think it's actually true, which is for fun, not necessarily for the writer's fun, but for the reader's fun. It is far more interesting to read a story than it is to read a research paper. Has that been your experience with school? <laughs> yes, you want to make this paper that you are writing fun to read throughout. You don't want your audience to completely lose track of the story just because you've switched over to the research part of it. So you're still wanting to include details. You're still wanting to take creative license in the way that you word things to make your readers want to keep reading. Does that make sense? Kind of? Yeah? Okay. Now that uh, now that we've kind of gone through class, how many of you know what you're going to be writing about for the research portion? Okay, most of you. All right, if you're still struggling with that, come back and see me and we can talk. But uh, you have 10 minutes now to keep working. Look at your two beginnings. See if you want to incorporate any of that into the real thing. But other than that, you will get this work done. Yeah. <laughs> You're turning in what we were done today. Yeah. The paragraph. You don't have to turn it. You don't have to turn it. No, I just wanted you to practice. Okay. So we can use that for our own essay. You are using it for your own essay. Yes. 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 Okay. Or if you hate what you did today and both of those openings, you got to start a third one and that's okay. Okay. Well, I already laid out the beginning of one. Okay. okay. I have three openings. I think my third one. Yes, uh, that's how I wanted it to work. I wanted it to get better and better. So wait, hang on. Yeah. Sounds no. like the uh, page limit. Okay. It's like the 3,000 words is the limit. So 3,000 words is the limit for the contest. For me, I say it's not making it over 10 pages. I would be a long time. But I have to read all of that. But then we have to cut it down. Because I'm like halfway there.
Okay. No, it's awesome. You're working harder. Hang on, let me stop the recording. Uh -huh.